Welcome to Startup Spotlight, where we explore visionary founders shaping our future. My name is Sabina, Sabina from Startup Bootcamp. I'm your host for today. And the question that we will be diving in is the role of AI and Web3 technologies in sustainable bit. So I'm joined today by three amazing founders. We have Valentina from Zero Trade, we have Peter from Wisebeam, and Marco from Lax AI. I think before we start, let's make a round of brief introductions. Tell us and the audience, of course, a bit about yourself, about your startup. Valentina, why don't you go first? Hello, everybody. So I met everybody yet, but okay. Uh, I'm Valentina. I am Chilean. I'm also a software engineer and a blockchain expert, I would say. I've been working in this for like six years, which is a lot in Latin America. I'm also very passionate about climbing and I've been a vegetarian for seven years. So also sustainability is a really big passion of mine. Um, and I would like to start introducing my company by saying that all companies emit carbon. It's something that we have to just kind of accept just by storing some data in a data center, you are emitting carbon in a way. So companies will have to comply with regulations and be carbon zero. But the way that they will do this is that they will finance green projects through financial instruments that are called climate assets. So if you emit 10 carboncitos, you buy 10 carboncitos. Basically, that's it. The problem with this process that it's called com uh, compensation is that in Latin America, there is no structure for this process. So it's done via email mostly. And this leads to lack of trust in the market, which makes the process last like 30 days. And it's costly because we have different currencies in all of the Latin American countries. So there's a big uh, financial fee with uh, bank transactions, especially. So what we're doing in Zero Trade is building a platform that will give structure to this market by allowing uh, the buying and the selling of these assets to be easy, to be automatic, by leveraging also blockchain technology in using crypto behind all of this. So we can reduce this cost by almost 30%. Well, very clear. I also really love the personal introduction. Very nice way to also connect to some of you, the listeners. Um, Peter, why don't you go next? Yeah. Hello, I'm Peter, CEO of Wisepam. And um, actually, uh, I live in the Netherlands, where I also studied at the University of Twente. And um, yeah, I got basically their uh, uh, background in philosophy. And the, the course was called uh, Philosophy of Science and Te Technology and Society. And um, that was also um, a bit of um, my starting point as starting an AI company, actually. So, um, um, yeah, it, it, of course, you have to deal with uh, lots of, uh, of societal issues when you're dealing with AI. And actually, um, yeah, it was quite inter interesting, all those dimensions. And when we start to work on Wisepream, um, that is a product information management system, um, we had to deal with um, AI as well and make their certain choices um, and evaluate th those as well. And Wisepream is actually a product where you can enhance your product data um, that will be sent to uh, web shops. And the main problem with uh, the normal product data from suppliers is, is that it's not um, um, a right in that it's not, has got not the right specifications or it's not translated to the correct languages. So companies can enrich their products and create great storytelling of it so that the expectation of the, 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 the buyer will also be better, you know, because a lot of product description lack, lack actually the, the, the specifications of the and the right uh, descriptions as well. So um, yeah, that's a short introduction of me. Very clear. And of course, when we talk about AI and Web3, it's impossible not to talk about ethical implications. Yes. So I'm sure that we will talk about it during the episode and that would be interesting to hear everyone's perspective. Now, Marco, what about you? Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Marco. I'm from Italy. And uh, let's say I have a pretty nerdy background because since five years, I'm a, a passionate and become a software engineer. And together with uh, Alessandro and Enrico, which are the other co-founder of Luxi, we have founded uh, Luxi AI, which is a startup based uh, in Estonia. And basically what you are doing is providing uh, AI services, uh, an AI assistant to retailers and e-commerce. This is because right now, basically, the focus is shifted from the product to the customers. And so customers are becoming more demanding. They want answer right now. They want to uh, answer like in, in all the different channels, like on Instagram, social, on the website. And so thanks to the artificial intelligence, we can create, let's say, a tailored solution for each of the customers. Basic, 
based also on let's say analyze the data of their preferences what they are looking for the the seasonality and so on well thank you for the introduction guys very clear i think also we see some common touch points as well as completely different ones so i think it will be very interesting to hear your opinion on the main question of course and let's uh, dive right into this one so of course uh, many companies right now are implementing ai and web3 technologies into trying to achieve sustainable development goals and follow of course their own agenda on sustainable business now from your pers perspective so what role does ai and web3 actually play in reducing that environmental impact and moreover how scalable these solutions actually are if we're talking about um, startups, uh, perhaps like yourself, but then also the large corporations. And uh, whoever would like to start, uh, please start. Again, this is more of a conversation rather than an interview also for our listeners. So nothing is prepared and I'm excited to see where the conversation takes us. I can jump in if you want. Please. Okay, so um, I can talk more about Web3, but I will tackle the tool. So from a computational perspective, right? These are two tools that are actually very consuming in electricity. It takes a lot of electricity to process data in a way that AI does it, and it takes a lot of electricity also to build the blocks that are needed for the blockchain. Different protocols are being developed in order to reduce this, and it's actually working, and you can find uh, better and better solutions each day, but this is something that it's important to say if we're talking about this. So in this way, when you calculate a carbon footprint, right, you will take into consideration, for example, how the, I don't know, how much you use for heating, how much uh, carbon you emit for transportation, right? And one of the scopes is electricity usage. So in the end, blockchain and AI, you will use to make some processes more efficient. Maybe there is a process that right now is making you consume a lot of heating or maybe a lot of fuel in transportation and by AI you uh, can make this process more efficient and so your emissions are less. However, you need to make sure that the amount of carbon that you are reducing is less than the one that you are using to compute all this data or the computational power that you're using. So for me, that's the main thing, like straight up, is to really know how much you are polluting by using these technologies and making sure that the processes that you're making more efficient are polluting less than the usage of this technology. Wait, wait. And is this something that you guys also see a bit more in your area, which is more in uh, e-commerce, sales, products? Mm, yeah, for sure, like in e-commerce. I mean, uh, uh, what we are trying to say also to reduce uh, is like the amount uh, of uh, returns when uh, the people are like buying because it's like a very not sustainable way in order to, let's say, buy a different product, try to fit and see if the, the, this product, uh, you like it, and then return on the others. And so by, let's say, a product recommendation, you can easily find your product, what you want, and so you don't need to buy like all the different choices that you can find on the website, try out at home, and then deliver uh, everything. So this is also another important aspect in sustainability, especially for the e-commerce. Peter, do you have something to add on that? Yeah, also uh, companies are trying to, uh, to um, uh, use less energy, for example, by finding open source models. And there's also like a big uh, place where everyone can reuse um, his model instead of training. Because a lot of the models needs to be trained and this is time consuming as well. But if you can reuse other people, their source code, for example, then you spend less energy on that. So um, that is also an improvement where, where companies are now finding the, the uh, optimi optimized pricing and costs, you know, like the benefits of that as well. And also, uh, try to reduce the, the impact they have on the environment. And because, uh, guys, we're all from different countries, of course, and operate in different markets, it would be also interesting to compare how it is currently in different markets. So maybe we can even start with Latin America. There is a lot to win from using Web3, Web3 especially in sustainability, in order to ensure that the data that is being stored, because basically blockchain, what it is, is a permanent Excel sheet, you know, is to know that the information you are storing is not depending on somebody that will maybe profit from changing that information. It's like written on a wall. So in the end, every process that needs to write a change of status, so 
to follow up on certain information that is being provided by a company and providing this information openly to users can benefit from this. And sustainability is a big area where this can be exploited because we have a lot of greenwashing and we know that there's a lot to win for companies by portraying themselves as more sustainable than they are. So in countries where you can find corruption, for example, in Latin America, when you have a big role of companies, even in governmental or state, you know, processes, it's very useful to have this world of how everything is being done uh, by the different companies and know that there's nobody that will try to change this information or that it's not possible. Thank you. Yeah, I think that can also be a very nice bridge to the second part of my initial question as to, okay, how is it compared to large corporations, but then also smaller startups? And how do you see this collaboration? And maybe for you guys, it might be a bit easier to answer this because I would again assume that you might work with products that are represented by large corporations, but then uh, how is the collaboration between the smaller uh, organization would work? Yeah, uh, let's say that uh, I think that Startup probably, let's say, mm, take uh, more into account this problem of sustainability than corporation. We can see also in some practical example that uh, all the different startup in different uh, fields, like uh, for example, artificial intelligence that came up right now, are always taking it into consideration in their business plan this kind of sustainability. And so a collaboration between startups and, and uh, big companies in this kind of field can be beneficial for both of them because uh, at least, uh, let's say, if, if all the startups can try to acknowledge big corporation about those problems, we can, let's say, make some difference, in, like in a big scale. And how would you approach actually educating uh, customers as well, consumers, about uh, all of this through all of your three products? So maybe you can start since you already developed it. Yeah, sure. Uh, let's say using artificial intelligence, for sure, based uh, on, uh, I don't know, product recommendation uh, or based on uh, some suggestion to give a little, little by little, day by day to the customers in order to acknowledge and uh, at least uh, see a different reality from what they always think. Why is that? Yeah, uh, to add on that, that's a great question, actually. Um, we see that uh, giving the right product recommendations can have, have huge impact on the envi environmental. And I will give an example why that is. Because the amount of returns, actually, in e-commerce is huge. Um, so by giving the right specifications, like for example, if you order uh, uh, shoes and it's, it's and you you expect to get order um, size, I mean uh, 38, but you get uh, size 40, you have to return it. And actually, that happened happened two months ago when my girlfriend was was uh, his birthday. I ordered shoes for her, and um, it was the the wrong size, so the specification did not match. So I had to return it. I had to. Uh, they had to ship it again, and I ordered it again. But what what happened? It was the the, the wrong shoe again. So I had to go by the transport two times. They had to ship it again, yeah. and that is on a lot on a small scale. So what? So you what you can imagine is like uh, giving the right product recommendation can have huge impacts on uh, on a better um, environment. Um, so that was also one uh, great thing. Second thing, um, and we try to do it in the future for Wisebeam, is um, educating our customers as well on what material is actually used in the product. Because we got, can analyze every uh, material, for example, in a t-shirt or another product, for example, plastics, or if it, is it's the material bamboo, we can uh, reduce as well the car carbon footprint because people will not, for example, order that specific product and choose an alternative sustainable product. And with AI, we can can just analyze all those materials. So there's a wealth of information which we then can use to leverage sustainability goals. You need to give me the first website and then we contact and offer directly Lux AI solution for them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we will talk a bit uh, later about the collaboration because I think that was actually a good point. No, but to your point, I absolutely agree. I know I work at Startup Bootcamp. I know I'm here with the impact founders and programs, yet I am very guilty of doing a lot of returns. <laughs> In my mind, it's better than keeping the thing that you will yeah. never use. Yeah. Then again, if the indeed the product specifications are always correct, that might be eliminated. Yeah. And also there's also waste, like for example, when you order the shoe, you have to unpack the package. So there's a lot of plastic and all this. I had to pack it in a new uh, box, mm -hmm. again with some new tape. 
So there was a lot of extra wastes as well. But you know, that's what I meant before. Probably the amount of energy used in AI to help this person get the right one is a lot less than what you get for the boat, to get the um, to get the shoes two times, maybe three times, yeah. the amount of paper, the amount of plastic, you know. So in the end, by using a little bit of computational power, yeah. you are really reducing a lot of waste and a lot of carbon emission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I also think in the education uh, space is a lot of to gain. Actually, like if we uh, empower people to think a bit more about, hey, I see a nice product, but um, hey, what uh, kind of material is actually used? Because you always know, like, hey, if you order something for cheap, you'll get cheap quality, you know? Yeah. But if you spend a bit more and, and that's sustainable, you can maybe wear it for five or 10 years. So you pay a bit more, more upfront, but in, on the long run, you uh, have more. Uh... No, and, and you know what? I think you're actually doing something really cool for the market because you are pushing forward Com like companies will know that they will have to be really explicit yeah. about what they are yeah. putting yeah. out. So they're not going to feel as comfortable as before. It's like, okay, you know what? Let's put this low quality yeah. material. They will not notice because you can even have like a grade, like yeah. <laughs> really bad material, yeah. you know, or something like so, that. And I actually think that that's by using artificial intelligence, we can actually be, be more proactive, like in the education space. In the, in the risk space, like what are the risks? Because AI can also predict those things. So it helps uh, a lot to find solutions as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, exactly. And of course, educating customers and what is one thing. Also educating corporations is another thing. Uh, so I would like you willing to talk a bit about that because I think Zero Trade is targeting more organizations rather than people. But and also to add to that and to add to the previous discussion, I mean, we also also even fashion companies that were trying to do these metaverse uh, fashion shows and uh, virtual clothing yeah. to be more sustainable. Whereas I'm pretty sure that whole thing costed way more than just trying to do a sustainable packaging. So questionable choices, but then Valentina, maybe you can tell a bit more how even with Zero Trade, for example, they could actually track uh, which activities of theirs are actually sustainable. Well, I think that there is kind of a mix of concept there because Okay, so for a company to compensate their carbon footprint, right, there has to be a process that's before that, that's the calculation of this carbon footprint, which is not part of the compensation process in itself. It's something that is, you know, individual of each of the companies, and there's many calculators for this. There's many companies that do this. It's a kind of a common service. So for sure, if you want to compensate, you will have to calculate your carbon footprint first. Um, however... What I think um, we were talking about before and that companies don't really uh, grasp is that many times companies that consider themselves sustainable don't consider the amount of electricity or the amount of computational power used in data center for their processes or how they're trying to do things. So in the end, to go through this process of calculation and then of compensation that you can use uh, with us and we... Uh, can have this transaction in the blockchain forever so you can bring com uh, confidence to your clients directly, etc. But it's also in the end an exercise of clear conscience of you as a company be really aware of how you're working on the inside and if you're really being helpful or, or if it's just, or if you are greenwashing, you know. Like I think that a lot of times companies don't even want to greenwash but in the end they do it because of this lack of information. So what we're trying to do is zero trade even though we attend directly to the compensation process and not the calculation process, is to support companies in understanding what resources they can use, what certifications they can opt for. And, you know, maybe it's something that we were we will integrate in the future. We are now concentrating in the compensation process, but through our platform, we want to engage companies with understanding that each of them is contributing to a problem, but that there is a solution. You can engage with different green projects uh, in your region to empower communities. There's this whole um, ecosystem in the calculation and in the compensation of the carbon footprint that will also involve the culture of your uh, own corporation. And that's also what we want to help um, produce in Latin America. Well, and I think that sounds like a beautiful mission. I will say the same thing as during the selection days. <laughs> Well, I do have also another um, question, of course, asking that to people 
in AI and Web3 might be a bit funny, and I know that you're building AI and Web3 solutions, but what would be the potential drawbacks or ethical considerations that you must take into account? And maybe Marco, you might already have an answer to that. Yeah, of course. Uh, like, uh, mm, let's say the potential drawback, uh, mm, not mainly related to sustainability, but uh, let's say to this kind of system is basically we are giving, uh, especially right now to open model like uh, GPT and Tropic and so on, we are giving potential uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, sensible data and uh, data that could be too personal and so create something that uh, at the end uh, could be biased, let's say. So we are believing that uh, this kind of artificial intelligence could give us the always the right answer, but maybe it will be just a biased, b biased answer because we are giving too, too many information about that kind of field. So this is one of the main problems that I, I think that we will need to face it. Do you guys tend to agree or...? Yeah, uh, to give uh, feedback on that, I think as well, indeed, you always have to keep uh, the human in control, basically, and maybe ask yourself, like, hey, AI is just a tool. We need to learn how to work with it. You know? So uh, basically have um, different kinds of uh, of uh, a board of regulations, for example, if you are a bigger company, because dealing with privacy can have huge impact within corporates. So if you leak out uh, information, it's quite... Uh, uh, important to uh, keep that in mind, but also educate people indeed. Like, hey, how, what, what can you feed to an AI and what not? You know, yeah. just uh, don't send your all your documents and be aware of that. So that's a big step that yeah. people have to take, and especially in large companies, that can be difficult. You know, because you have to set up a, a team who can uh, educate people, and there might be some uh, differences in uh, in people know what AI can do and people not. So. All those perspectives are really important to take into account. I really agree on that. Also because, let's say, I don't believe that uh, we are close to an artificial intelligence that can, uh, let's say, take the control of the world. By now, artificial intelligence is just an instrument that can help you in your daily life. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, educate people on how to yeah. use that and uh, when you need to use that. Because sometimes artificial intelligence can also be dangerous because you're using it in a not correct way or you are abusing it because you think that is the only answer that uh, uh, that is the, is the only correct answer. So this kind of educational uh, purpose, especially for uh, let's say new employees, uh, maybe uh, people that are now graduating from university and go to artificial intelligence company, need to be educated on this kind of field because it's really important. Yeah, I think that the, with Web3, oh, Web3, Web3, there's something similar because in the end, Okay, so the blockchain is just, as I said, having a wall that you cannot change, like a permanent Excel sheet, right? But if you put garbage in a box, still the box has garbage. Uh, so, yeah. you know, you have to be careful with the input. So if you're, for example, uh, tracking some, you know, supply chain or some process in the blockchain, you have to be careful of how you're inputting this data, where are you getting this data from? Because it will be there forever and it will be just be garbage data forever. So in the end, just as in AI, the logistic, like the logic behind the conclusions of the, of the AI will always be the same and will be logically correct. But you don't know if the input that you're putting in will allow the conclusion to be correct in, the, in a real world context. And the same with blockchain. If you are inputting data that is incorrect, the blockchain will keep it there, but it will be incorrect data. So I think that's the, the important thing. Yeah. And like artificial intelligence is the same as like garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> so keep attention on what you put in. Yeah. And also like uh, try to put also the attention on uh, what comes out. Even if you're putting, let's say, good stuff yeah. in, you need to adapt uh, yeah. the output to your needs. And also so it's not, let's yeah. say, uh, uh, something that is 100% accurate for all the scenarios. You need to, let's say, to other way time based on your scenario. And maybe to add on that is like maybe we, we can also zoom out and, and with many corporations how we can work together but also keep each other um, a bit uh, um, in touch uh, and um, also um, yeah create um, like a certain policies which can all have an overarching uh, regulation as well so that would be quite interesting because one company can do for good, but other company can, of course, say, um, I don't look at those regulations, I'm only for profit. So um, that's also quite interesting as well. Yeah. So that's why there are many uh, regulations now uh, 
um, the people are quite busy with this. And I think in, also in the, U the European Parliament, there are also um, um, investigating those things. And we, as, as different companies, have to give our feedback as well to also be uh, guided in, in this uh, scenario because AI is quite new, right? Mm -hmm. I read something really interesting and also very linked to what you said. It's that, so right now AI is being fed mostly in Europe and in the USA, right? Yeah. So there's a lack of information from other communities, from yeah. Africa, sure. from Latin America, from Oceania. So in the end, the, the resolutions that it's getting to and the precedent that AI uses to reach the conclusion is yeah. really biased towards the Northern Hemisphere and some countries of the Northern Hemisphere. So in the end, to take decisions that will be uh, pertinent for, you know, for example, Latin American countries, they will use conclusions that are not fit for them. Yeah. So they will have to exist some kind of like AI based on region, based on ethnicity group, based on religion, you know, depends on what you're trying to get. It's it's a person like you will not at, uh, ask an expert in European regulations what to do with the Chilean law. You know? Yeah, and especially the, the human values as well. Mm -hmm. There was like a famous, uh, famous case and uh, it's also documented in a, in a documentary on Netflix, I think it's called The Coded Bias, in which basically a uh, faced algorithm uh, recognized, let's say, black people uh, more prone to be, let's say, guilty instead of white people. But just because, let's say, on the training data, there were like more black faces that uh, are connected to guilty people instead of white people. And so, as you said, it could be biased because, let's say, the data that we fed into the artificial intelligence are, let's say, more labeled in a wrong way. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, from everything that I hear, it does sound that we are still a little bit too far from completely being perfect with application of AI and Web3 to make the businesses sustainable. But um, also for our listeners, um, we are typically investors, mentors, corporate leaders. So take that into account when you answer the next question. Uh, in your opinion, if you could enforce one thing to be applied by corporations or consumers, depending on the product, to make sure that we are driving into the right direction with the sustainability in terms of AI and Web3. What is the one thing that you would like everybody to know, to be mindful of using your product or outside of your product, but only one thing so that our audience can also take it into account when making their decision? For me, as like I always say this, probably my CEO and co-founder will agree, <laughs> Joaquin, that you don't have to hammer a nail with a building, you know. So really be conscious about what process you're putting this type of technology into and if you're capable of feeding it with the right information for it to really work. And to do this, I think there's always had to be a third party that is impartial, that is involved. Like, I really believe in the power of being audited and using these technologies in order to make being audited in an easy process, right? Um, but for me, it's that to not trust that technology will do everything for you, but really be mindful that you're not hammering a nail with a building. Yeah. Good one. Peter, Marco? Well, from my side, uh, I think that the, the most important aspect is, let's say, to focus on little stuff that you can do it and you can improve it. Like uh, in my, let's say, in, in, in my case, in the e-commerce side, it's like, for example, try to reduce uh, all the waste, uh, try to reduce uh, everything that uh, is like uh, environment, uh, that, that is environmental cost. Like, so it, you don't necessarily to, let's say, revolutionize the world, but it's just important to do some, some little stuff in order to make a big change at the end. And another aspect that is important connected to what we said before is like, let's say, AI education. So understand uh, what AI can do, what AI cannot do, and how to use it. Because right now we are, let's say, in a, in a hype situation of the AI because uh, all the people are talking about the AI, but many, many people are talking about the AI without knowing how it works uh, and uh, which are the potential, let's say. Yeah, for us, um, um, our focus will be on um, integrating the, the shared values um, and, and not only the technical side. So we talked a lot about now today about sustainability and uh, we can integrate it as well during our development. Um, so like I said, like for example, product recommendations, it can really help if you uh, have better 
recommendations and have less returns, but there could be many more factors. And um, that we can, we can really use AI and sustainability to empower uh, also a better product uh, in that case. So um, that's quite interesting. Now, thank you very much, Valentina, Peter, Marco, for joining me today. I think that it was very insightful. Thank you, listeners who stayed with us. And I hope that you enjoyed, again, the tips, uh, some tricks, especially the ones that our founders gave on how to spot the correct or incorrect use of AI and Web3 technologies in trying or actually making the business sustainable. Now, if you enjoy this type of uh, content, if you want to explore further the innovation ecosystem, then Startup Bootcamp is the place for you. Whether you are an investor and you want to explore investment in startups or you want to mentor a startup, or if you're a founder yourself, please join. Go to startupbootcamp.org, check out the events that we have, find us on our socials and connect with our team. We will be happy to see you here uh, virtually and physically. And don't forget to tune in into the next episode of Startup Spotlight. And remember, innovation will save the world.